Welcome back. I'm Chris Potts. This lecture is part of our unit on building effective distributed word representations. The focus of this lecture is on matrix reweighting, the mechanics of it and also the motivations for doing it. The goal of reweighting in broad terms is to amplify the things in your data that are important, that are trustworthy, and that are unusual, while at the same time de-emphasizing the things that are mundane, that are quirky, and that might be simply mistakes in the data. Now, absent a defined objective function, this will remain fuzzy, and we'll look at approaches later in the unit that specify a precise objective. But the intuition is clear. We want to move away from raw counts because frequency in and of itself is a poor proxy for the above semantic values that we're trying to target. We can also set ourselves some general goals. I'm assuming that, by and large, the values we are starting with are pure distributional counts. Thus, we already have information about raw frequency of occurrence and co-occurrence. So we can assess methods for reweighting by looking at how far they take us from those counts and where we end up after all the calculations. Here are some specific sub-questions we could address. How does the reweighted value compare to the original raw count value in the cell? How do the reweighted values compare to the overall word frequencies? And finally, what is the overall distribution of values that the reweighting scheme delivers? One other point is near and dear to me as a linguist. I'm going to assume that we would prefer not to do feature selection based on counts, stop word dictionaries, and so forth. Our models should sort these things out for us. For example, if her, him, and it turn out to be important because they are the titles of movies, then our method should pick up on that. We don't want to have filtered these things out ahead of time only to find out that they're important. We looked briefly at normalization in the context of vector comparison methods. Such methods can also be thought of as a kind of reweighting. Here are two simple normalization methods. The first uses the L2 norm, or vector length, as the normalizing quantity. And the second, a more purely probabilistic view, uses the sum of all the values in the row to create a new normalized vector. This slide is repeated from the lecture on vector comparison. It shows how the L2 norm moves us away from the raw frequencies. We saw in that lecture that this reweighting essentially solved the problem we set for ourselves, which was to capture the sense in which A and B, here in this toy matrix, are more alike than B and C, at least in a semantic sense, despite the fact that the raw Euclidean distances go in the opposite direction. On the left here, we have the original Euclidean space plotting the frequency values, and you can see that A and B are far apart relative to B and C. So it looks like that space doesn't achieve our semantic objective. However, after doing the normalization row-wise to create this new reweighted matrix over here, when we plot the distances, we can see that our objective is now met in the sense that A and B are relatively close together, and B and C are relatively far apart. Next, let's take a more in-depth look at relative frequencies. We can think of this reweighting as creating conditional distributions over columns given row values. That's the perspective taken here. Or we can think of it as creating a conditional distribution over rows given a specific column value. That's the perspective taken here. I'm illustrating with a slightly more complex example than before to bring out a drawback to normalization that we should watch out for. It can obscure information about the amount of evidence that we have. For example, rows A and B in this matrix are very different in terms of their token counts, but the normalization step makes them look almost identical, as you can see over here. In a perfect world, where all evidence was trustworthy, this would be unproblematic. But the reality of big data sets is that we often need to see things happen a lot of times before we can trust them. So in that sense, the evidence that we have in row A might simply be more trustworthy than the evidence given to us by row B, whereas our reweighting re scheme is obscuring that difference. At the start of this lecture, I stated that one of our goals is to move away from raw counts. Thus, for any reweighting scheme we consider, we should ask about how correlated it is with the original counts, 
This slide begins that kind of comparative exploration. Here is the distribution of cell values, just token co-occurrence counts, in the large word-by-word -word matrix. I put the x-axis on a log scale so that we can see the, the structure more clearly. As we would expect, the values are biased toward the low end and they taper off very gradually, forming a long tail of very high counts, which correspond to very high frequency function words, typically. Here's the same word-by-word -word matrix after row normalization, that is, just dividing each value by the sum of values in its row. This distribution is shifted to a roughly normal distribution. And here's a look at the correlation between the original counts and the normalized one. The x-axis gives the original log co-occurrence count, and the y-axis gives the relative frequency, that is, the normalized value. There is a very strong linear correlation between the two, as the plot makes clear. So I think it's fair to say that, for many purposes and from many perspectives, we might as well not have bothered to do the normalization, because it still basically encodes the underlying frequency information. Term frequency inverse document frequency, or TF-IDF, is a method that will break our strong correlation with frequency. The calculation has two main parts, the TF part and the IDF part. TF corresponds to column-wise normalization, as defined here. It captures in each document the frequency of each word in that document. IDF is a measure of a word's prevalence across documents. The numerator is the number of documents in the corpus. And the denominator is the number of documents in the corpus that contain the target word W here. The TF-IDF value is then simply the product of those two values, the TF and the IDF. Let's see how this works for a small example. Uh, here's a little matrix. Uh, we first calculate the IDF values, which are the same for each row. Next, we calculate the TF values, which corresponds to column-wise normalization. And then we multiply corresponding units to get the reweighted matrix. That's given down here. And this one is noteworthy because word A gets a TF-IDF value of 0. As you can see in the original matrix, word A occurs in every document, which gives it an IDF value of 0. More generally, TF-IDF will punish words that occur in many documents, thereby potentially handling for us the relative lack of distinguishing information in high-frequency function words. Let's take a quick look at IDF values in more detail. The x-axis gives the document count, and the y-axis gives the IDF values for a corpus of 10 documents. And you can see that the IDF value reaches its peak when the word is in relatively few documents, and it reaches its nadir when the word is either in every document in the corpus or when it's in none of them. Here's a look at some representative TF-IDF values. The x-axis is the raw TF value, the term frequency value, and the y-axis gives you the number of documents that the word co-occurs occurs in. The TF-IDF values are largest when the word is highly frequent and occurs in relatively few documents. And correspondingly, the values get smaller as the word occurs in more documents or as it becomes less frequent in those documents. Here we continue our method of looking at how the reweighted values relate to frequency. TF-IDF is most naturally paired with word by document matrices, or similarly sparse word by context ones. So here's the distribution of cell values in a raw word by document matrix. It's very, very heavily skewed toward very low frequency values because of its sparseness. Here's a look at the distribution of TF-IDF values for the same matrix. You can see it's very nicely normal. The point of greatest interest is that TF-IDF really breaks the dependence on raw frequency. In this plot, the x-axis gives the original count, and the y-axis gives the TF-IDF values. Uh, and in the plot, it's hard to discern any trend between those two. Here's one more perspective. 
The x-axis gives the overall word frequency of each word, that is the sum of all the column values for each row. And the y-axis is again the TF-IDF value. And it looks like TF-IDF values reached their peak for words that are neither too uh, infrequent nor too frequent, which seems like a good sign. Highly infrequent words might not be trustworthy, and highly frequent ones typically aren't all that informative for the kinds of questions we are investigating. Let's look at one more reweighting scheme in detail. This is pointwise mutual information, or PMI. Unlike TF-IDF, it gives the same values whether we take the row or column perspective. The numerator here is the joint probability of the word and the document. And the denominator is a product of the word probability, that is the row probability, and the document probability, or the column probability. Here's the example matrix from our TF-IDF discussion. Uh, the PMI calculation is easiest to gr get a grip on if one first makes a joint probability table by dividing all of the cell values by the total of all the cell values. That's this inner matrix here. And it gives the numerator values here. And then the row and column values mentioned in the denominators are just the sums of the rows and the columns respectively. I've given those at the margins here. Having done all those calculations, we apply the definition to get the reweighted matrix. It looks very different from the TF-IDF values. Two things stand out. First, row A, which had all zero values for TF-IDF, doesn't stand out especially in this new reweighting scheme. Second, the tiny value in the lower right corner of our original matrix has been amplified to become the largest value in the reweighted one. This is likely a cause for concern. It is well known that PMI tends to overstate the importance of small values. Here's a look at some representative PMI values. We hold the joint probability at 0.25 and vary the row and the column probabilities to get different PMI values. The largest circle here corresponds to the largest possible value under these assumptions. And you can see that the values go negative when 0.25 starts to look small relative to the row and column product. Continuing our comparative methods from before, here's the distribution of counts for the word-by-word -word matrix I used earlier in the lecture. PMI creates a normal distribution around zero. And PMI really breaks the connection between the original and reweighted cell values. As before, the x-axis gives the original values, and now the y-axis gives the PMI values. The PMI values reach their peak at the not too rare but not too frequent values, which seems desirable. And overall, there isn't a strong relationship between the original and reweighted values. And here's the comparison with overall word frequencies. The x-axis, again, gives the overall frequency of the word, the sum of all the column values for each row. And the y-axis is the PMI value. And it looks like PMI values are largely unrelated to the original word frequencies. I'm not sure what accounts for this drop-off here, but in gen general it looks like it's flat across this whole frequency space. What I showed you before is the basic PMI calculation. It has some variants that are worth considering. First, Laplacian smoothing adds a constant value to the entire matrix before PMI begins. This can help with cases where the PMI value would be technically undefined because of trying to take the log of zero. I don't really recommend this, though, unless you have solid motivations for picking a particular smoothing value. Otherwise, the behavior of this variant can be quite unpredictable. PMI with contextual discounting is presented by Turney and Pentel in their 2010 overview of vector space models. I won't go into this calculation here, but the goal is to discount low frequency events to help PMI overcome its bias for such events, as we saw in the previous example. Finally, positive PMI simply treats all negative PMI values as zero. In a recent paper called Neural Word Embeddings as Implicit Matrix Factorization, Omar Levy and Joav Goldberg make a simple case for this method. In general, for PMI, we take log zero to be zero, but this means that unattested events get a value of zero, whereas attested ones with lower than expected probability actually get negative weight. This ranking 
uh, broad ranking does not relate intuitively to our observations. Positive PMI addresses this by mapping both unattested and unlikely events to zero. This also creates a sparser matrix which has computational advantages and might create sharper empirical distinctions. To close this lecture, let me mention a few other approaches to weighting and reweighting. Uh, the first, expected values, is similar to the intuition behind the chi-squared test or the g-test. The t-test can also be thought of as a weighting scheme. It's worth mentioning also that there are versions of TF-IDF that seek to be sensitive to the true distribution of words and word types, thereby arguably achieving a more precise version of the underlying intuition behind this calculation. And finally, one can even think of the pairwise distances between words as determining a symmetric reweighted matrix. Here I've used cosine similarity to give you an intuitive sense for what that would be like.